Coming up on Car Advice, urban friendly people haulers. We compare the Holden Acadia, Mazda CX-9 and the Toyota Kluger in a mammoth seven seat SUV test. SUV styling and all wheel drive. We hit the road in the 2019 Holden Calais Ventura to taste what Holden has on the menu for Aussie families. And the dreaded flashing blue lights. Albors Faller joins the panel to reveal why the Queensland Police Force has adopted the Kia Stinger as its go-to highway patrol car. Welcome to Car Advice, I'm Trent Nikolic. Thank you once again for joining us. Another huge week in automotive. We're gonna take a look at the Holden Acadia versus Mazda CX-9 versus Toyota Kluger. That's a real battleground for that SUV segment. The Holden Calais Tourer. We think the new Holden Commodore is a pretty good car and we reckon the Tourer is the one you should be buying. And the Kia Stinger. Who'd have thought that'd ever be a police car, but Car Advice founder Albors Faller will join us on the panel to talk about the Queensland Police and their new Kia Stinger. Paul, joining me at the desk again, mate. Good evening, thank you for being here. Thank you, mate. Let's get straight into it. First up, Paul, the Holden Commodore. It's hard to believe that the new Holden Commodore already needs a facelift. Look, it's confusing, it and I'll tell you little, why. Yeah. Uh, PSA, which is the, the Peugeot Citroen Alliance, has purchased the Opal brand. Yep. So we now have a situation where the Commodore, which is no longer Australian, but is an Opal, mm. is now French. Yep. And, this and he's facelift. no longer an Opal. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. So this facelift would have already been locked in well in advance of, of that whole deal going down. But it puts a bit of confusion out there because currently the facelift, yes, it may have been locked in, but some of the internal IP, such as the infotainment system, yep. if they want to move to a new version of MyLink, which is currently the one that's seen on the new Holden Acadia. And it's a good system. It's a fantastic MyLink's system. MyLink's really good. It may mean that they don't have access to that, yeah. depending on what the, the patent agreements are. Yeah. And then if you're moving then to the PSA system, which is not that mm, good. <laughs> not as good at all. Yeah. just ruin the car. So yeah. it really makes no sense to me. And we're, we're expecting to see what this facelift looks like shortly, but it does look like it's just a, a minor nip and tuck at the mm. front and rear. So a big question mark over that. Well, the new Commodore was already a stylish thing. So hopefully these updates make it appeal to the public even more because it's a good car and yeah. Holden needs it to succeed. The latest in a long line of stupid automotive names, the 2019 Tesla Model Y. Let me tell you why. Why bother, Paul? No, let me tell you yep. why it's the Model Y. So mm. they have the Model S, they have the Model 3, they have the Model X, X, <laughs> and they have the Model Y. Mm. So that spells sexy. Oh, is that what... So oh. cue the laughter. I actually so, didn't know that. <laughs> let's talk about the realistic thing here, which is the car starts at 39,000 US dollars. Mm. Um, and Trent, let me tell you when you can get that. Yeah. Not any time soon. That's right. So if I've ordered my Model 3, which I still don't have, uh, we've now released a new car from yep. Tesla that you still can't have. So late 2020. Oh, good. And the entry level, which is the $39,000 car, isn't expected to be available until 2021. Mm. And what I find really troubling for Tesla at the moment is SUVs are booming. I don't know if yeah. you've heard. No, I haven't noticed that. Yeah. Globally, they are absolutely right, booming. Can I that? <laughs> yeah. I'll so this that thing is effectively just a big version of the Model 3. Mm. It looks exactly like a Model 3. Yeah. So if this is still late 2020, what on earth are they going to do between mm. now and then? Surely, mm. if this is just a bigger version of the Model 3, you could have rolled that out now because this Absolutely. is where the market is at. Advice at caradvice.com. Let us know if you've ordered a Model 3. I'd really like to hear if you've ordered one, what you're hearing as a consumer from Tesla. Let us know. Advice at caradvice.com. Well, this is one that's surely going to polarise people. Quite possibly our attitude might polarise people. This is the Ford Falcon, not the GTHO. Backstory behind this car, it was effectively a car that was kiboshed by Ford and the engineers behind the, the GTF and, and all the fast cars at Ford uh, developed this in their spare time and they, they virtually had a completed product, but for whatever reason, Ford wasn't able to release it. And now what they've come out and said is that if you have a supercharged V8 Falcon, like a Sprint 8, mm. you'll be able to supercharge it a little bit more. <laughs> now we're talking about some serious mumbo here, 483 kilowatts of power, 753 newtons metres of torque. So that is some incredible yeah. numbers, yeah. but it's going to cost you a lot of money. $30,000 for the work on the engine, mm. $14,500 for the wheel and tyre package. Mm -hmm. 
Is that insane? It's completely insane, and I reckon they'll sell every package that they've got. There's I, only 100 I, of them. That's right. I think Ford fans would be lining up for them. Um, our guy in Sydney, Josh Dowling, has driven it and said it's a monster. Uh, he did the launch drive with John Bow, who also said it's a little bit unhinged. But what I think is the real question here is how did Ford get this so wrong originally? With this engine, the Miami, Ford spent a bucket load of money engineering a supercharged V8 engine. Yep. This, my understanding was, was meant to make it into the Mustang, mm. into the, the new generation Mustang, sure. but it never happened. So this was money that was just blown away into, into oblivion. Mm. So it is sad that we can only get it now, years after the Falcon has gone, and mm. that you have to already own an expensive supercharged Falcon to get one. But let us know, have you placed an order? Yes. Advice at caradvice.com. Mm. If so, we need to have a drive. One of the segments that's changed a hell of a lot in the last decade or so, Paul, is large SUVs, and there's yeah. good reason for that. Once upon a time, if you wanted a large SUV, you were looking at something, I mean, traditionally, even a 100 series or a Nissan Patrol, exactly, but yeah. they've moved up into upper large, what we call upper large SUV. So you were originally looking at something like a Toyota Prado. However, what a lot of buyers were finding and the feedback back then, you know, over a decade ago, was that they were very truck-like to drive. Yep. So what's changed now with the large SUV segment is there's been a move to SUVs that drive a lot more like cars. And the three that we're looking at here I think in terms of affordable SUVs, if you take expensive Europeans out of the equation, are uh, ones that actually drive a lot more like cars. So we've got Mazda CX-9, Toyota Kluger, and Holden Arcadia. Those three there mm. are particularly car-like, aren't they? You know what, Kluger is such a synonymous name it with is. SUVs. Yeah. I can think back to growing up. Yeah. Kluger was, you know, the car that perhaps the richer kids had. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say working class families. Well, yeah, yeah. wasn't me. Yeah. But um, that's the thing. It's, it, it is a segment now that it's kind of the default if you have two, three kids yep. or if you're relegated to transporting other kids around mm -hmm. to soccer practice. Yep. We've said previously as well that while these don't really take adults in the third row, they're all fantastic options if you do have that situation where yep. you're driving kids around. Now, let's talk about lengths of these cars mm. because what surprised me the most is the Mazda is actually the longest here at over five metres long. That's yeah, you, caprice size. That's caprice size, yeah. yeah that's like a very large um, sedan in yeah. the old money. And what's most interesting to me here is Mazda's probably as traditionally involved here as Kluger. It came a little bit later to yep. the party. The Holden Acadia is the newest member of the, uh, of the group. And I think they've done a really good job with this vehicle. I think it's one yeah. of the better vehicles in the Holden portfolio, to be yeah. honest with you. The Equinox has failed to fire for yeah. Holden, but the Acadia is kicking some goals. That They've is. got some sharp drive away pricing. And this whole segment here that we're looking at is the mid-spec, around $50,000. And Holden has really delivered here in terms of infotainment. Yep. This is the latest version of MyLink infotainment, which has Apple CarPlay, Android. We Auto, love that. Built-in nav. It's yep. super fast, super easy to use. The interior actually feels nice and premium, mm. and it's fantastic to drive and that's because the Holden engineers have done local ride and handling yeah. tuning on it. Yeah. It's built for Australian roads. If you go to caradvice.com you can read this full comparison but you made the point there, mid-grade models. So the Kluger is GXL spec, Acadia is LTZ and the CX-9 is Touring and out of the three there's only three and a half grand separating all yep. three of them so they're very close both in terms of specification and on paper. Now with the infotainment thing there, I think for me it's often been something that manufacturers overlook because aside from the steering wheel when you sit in the car, yep. infotainment is what you interact with the most in a vehicle beyond yep. anything else. Now these days, when you can plug your smartphone in and then put the phone in the console, in the glove box, never have to even look at it again and interact through the infotainment system, it's a big deal to get that right. And I think Holden is clearly ahead of the other yep. two because while the Mazda MZZ system was good before, it was excellent, set some standards. It's been caught up by a lot of the other manufacturers now. And I think the Holden's the clear leader here against the other two, especially the Toyota. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, if we then step over to that Kluger, it is again that same sort of $50,000 mark. Inside it has stacks of room and being a Toyota, it's built I guess, it, I'm not going to say built to a price, but it's built to be durable. That's right. They seem to just yeah. build their interiors yeah, that's so right. that they're ready for your kids to come and attack them with food and all sorts <laughs> of other stuff. Throw things at them. Um, the only downside with the Kluger, though, despite its size inside, is that infotainment system yeah. because it misses out on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. And this is despite the fact Toyota has this technology available to them in the US. So it is a little bit disappointing there. And then we step over to the CX-9, which we've already said is a big car, but inside it feels really premium. And at this level here, you want something that feels a little nice, but isn't 
too easily mm. damaged. Yep. And that's where that Mazda really comes into its own. They even have clever features in terms of getting kids in and out of that third yep. row. And the boots on each of these cars are importantly big as well. Well, one of the other measurements that's really important with these is turning circle. And crucially, oh, yeah. all three of them, because you're going to be driving these around town, shopping centres, tight city streets, that kind of thing, all three of them 11.8 metres. I think it's really interesting as well taking a look at some of the engine specifications here. So the Mazda's 2.5 litre turbo is the least powerful with 170 kilowatts. The 3.5 litre Toyota, 218 kilowatts, so it yep. makes a fair bit of power. But then you step up to the 3.6 litre Holden, 231 kilowatts. So again, if you're using these loaded up, if you've got four or five people on board all the time with luggage, the more power you've got, the better. But <laughs> there's an exception here, and be. that's torque. Yeah, exactly. So true, the Mazda, yeah. while it is down on power, it pumps out a fair bit of torque, 420 newton metres That's the most. to the other two. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the other two are 367 for the Acadia, yeah. and then a little less, 350 for the Kluger. But the interesting thing here is that We've mentioned this in previous segments before. While the V6, yes, will consume more fuel, it's only marginal. Yeah. Because they've had to wind the wick up on that CX-9. It weighs a fair bit mm -hmm. as well. And the CX-9's official is 8.4 litres of fuel per 100 kilometres. Yep. But the other two are around the 9.3 mm. litres per 100 kilometres mark. And that's partly thanks to these switchable four-wheel mm. drive systems as well. So you don't need to always be in all-wheel drive where the car consumes more yeah, fuel. Yeah, that's true. And look, I can live with that mid-nine range for a large yeah. SUV. That's fine. That's not a problem at all. And I, look, I think it's a factor for people buying them, yeah. but I can certainly live with it. Okay. I'm going to get, we've got to get off the fence here. Yes. Say you've got your money to buy, you're in this mid-grain, um, mid-spec yep. kind of market. Which one are you buying? Out of these three, which one are you putting your money down for? Okay. So for me, it's going to be the Holden. Now, the reason I say oh, this, this is problematic. Yeah. We're, we're going to agree on something. Okay. Yeah. Oh, watch out. This is a worry. I, I'll leave now. <laughs> um, no, look, it's, it, it is the, the best to drive here. Uh, the engine is fantastic mm. and the infotainment system is really good. They all now have five-year warranties yeah. as well, but the driveway pricing is really sharp and I feel confident in that car. Yeah. The Mazda is, is also confidence inspiring, but I reckon that engine could just lack a little mm. bit of punch. And the Toyota just misses out on some of this modern technology that it really needs. Yeah. I agree with you, the Holden for me as well. I know a lot of people might not have expected that because Holden hasn't been as successful in the last 12 to 18 yeah. months as people suspected. But this thing, this Acadia is really, really good. So for me, it's the Holden. Advice at caradvice.com. Let us know which one of the three you'd buy. Paul, I'm on record as saying that the new Holden Commodore is a good car. Yep. Um, and if you How haven't driven it, you? it went really well. <laughs> 1,300 comments on the website <laughs> later, uh, most of them disagreeing with me, but crucially, yep. most of them by people who've never driven it, never even sat in it, which Spot was the on. point of my original thing. If you haven't driven it, you don't know whether it's good or bad. We think the new Commodore is a really good vehicle. I don't mind upsetting people, so I'll say it again here now. Yep. Um, however, here, we've had a look at the one that we think is actually the pick of the range, because while the Commodore range itself is pretty good and it's well priced. This Tourer or wagon uh, I think is probably the one you buy, isn't it? I love the look yep. of it and I think it's practical. Absolutely. And I said, uh, I had the chance to drive the Commodore as a 65% prototype. So yep. that was like with still moulds of plastic inside. And, and I said at the time that this is the car that's going to do the best for them mm. because it looks sensational. You get the plastic cladding, which yep. makes it look like it's an SUV yep. and it has a giant <laughs> boot as well. And it's, it's just a really good car in terms of features too. So $53-odd thousand dollars gets you heated and cooled seats. Mm. You get an 8-inch infotainment system with MyLink, inbuilt navigation. You get remote start. You have a fantastic V6 engine with all-wheel drive. Yeah. And best of all, there is so much room inside. Like you get into that second row, you can almost fit another row in front of you. It's it a, a segment, whopper. yeah, it's a segment bigger than something like a Camry or a Mazda oh, yeah. 6 in terms of interior space, yeah. isn't it? Just go back a couple of steps. That 60% prototype that you drove, that's a really interesting thing. And it's something that we get to do a lot at Car Advice, which is a real privilege of the job. We get to have a look at these cars before they're released for sale. What point in the engineering testing were they up to when you drove that? Where were they at? 60%, uh, they had to work very hard to allow us any anywhere near the car because right. when you see this thing, anyone that doesn't know that they're looking at a 60% prototype would go, oh my God, this mm. is probably going to be the worst car they've ever built. <laughs> yeah. But it had a lot of cladding on it. The headlights weren't complete. But at that point, they knew what the drivetrain was going to be like. Right. They knew what the all-wheel drive system would be like. And they were quite confident. And the thing that irritates me the most with a lot of the people that are, that are quite negative against this car, mm. we've benchmarked it against the, the VF2 Commodore extensively, both the four-cylinder yep. and the V6. 
and it outperforms it, it in does. virtually every single way. Yep. Obviously not the V8, but people weren't buying the V8. That, yep. that is a fact. 30% of sales. A fact. Yep. So uh, it, it is a good car in that sense. We've done a lot of dirt road driving, yep. and where this car really excels is the volume of Australian input. That's what I was about to say just before you go on there. I was about to make that point that a lot of people who've been negative about this Commodore yep. have forgotten that a lot of the engineers, a lot of the expertise that was going into the old Commodore that was built in Australia yep. has been directed into this new one. So a lot of the team that work on ride and handling and the chassis tuning, they're the same people, the same men and women, the same engineers that were working on the old Commodore, aren't they? Yep. So when you were lauding the SSV Redline for being a performance masterpiece, yep. uh, the same guy that did that car <laughs> yeah. worked on this. And That's I can it. tell you that when you do push this towards its limits, it is an exceptional vehicle, yeah. and especially when the going gets tough, and that's traditionally where Commodore didn't work. As a rear-wheel drive car, there were always limitations in the wet and also when you started pushing it. This all-wheel drive system is state-of-the-art. It's called a Twinster all-wheel drive system. Yeah. It allows the car to direct torque to the rear axle when required. It has an internal clutch pack for torque vectoring on that rear axle. So it is a really good product. In terms of the way it handles Australian roads, it is second to none. Again, because they've had years to fine-tune this that's in right. Australia, yeah. it really nails that package and it will as well, 2,100 kilos. Now let's have a look at something you touched on there before, infotainment, because obviously we spend a lot of time in the car. We've yep. talked about the space. I think the fact it's a wagon obviously opens up a huge amount of luggage space. But 560 I think litres. That's, that's enormous. Yeah, yeah, 560 litres is a lot. I think where we're at now with this particular vehicle, if you look at the mid $50,000 range, it's fair to say that that kind of money buys you more car than it ever has before in an overall sense. And I think that's most evident in things like infotainment and the technology, isn't it? Oh, hands down, the seats are really nice. You've got yep. massage seats and that type of thing. The only place it's really let down is, well, two areas. You can only get the Calais V Tourer with the V6. Right. So it's only available as an all wheel drive V6. But it also doesn't have the clearance of something like a Subaru Outback. So yep. often people will go to a Subaru Outback because they don't oh, want an yeah. SUV, mm. but you do get the same sort of clearance mm. as an SUV. This is only marginally higher than a standard station wagon. So despite its appearances, it won't be able to go to like a campsite or that type of thing. So I would have loved to see this thing sitting a little higher mm. off the ground, but then you lose some of those performance characteristics. Yeah, so right. it is a bit of a fine balance there. Now we often say, and if you've read any review that I've done at caradvice.com recently on SUVs, I kind of lament the fact that a lot of people just rush, rush out to an SUV with no real reason for buying yeah. one. Um, it, you know, my neighbour's got one or they're the most popular car on the school run, I think I need one. Let's have a quick look at the kind of buyer that should be looking at this car. I'm thinking if you're looking at something like a Mazda CX-5, for yeah. example, uh, a RAV4 if you're in the Toyota stable, or perhaps even a Honda CRV, if you're looking at any of those kinds of vehicles, you should be considering this, shouldn't you? Well, it's got a, a way bigger boot. That's I mean, right. Uh, yeah. The CX-5 is, is, is a much smaller boot than this. Yep. The only downside you're going to have with a wagon in comparison to an SUV is if you're fitting child seats. Yep. Um, but obviously, once you fit them once, it's not really... That's an it. ongoing concern. Mm. Uh, you do have ISO fixed points in the two outboard seats right. here and the door aperture is really good when you open it. And best of all, it's got a really cool panoramic sunroof. So if your kids are in the back, they'll love it to see some really cool yeah, stuff. Yeah, they'll absolutely love it. Now, look, we've had a lot of feedback, obviously, on why people don't like the Commodore. But lately, since we started the TV show, we've had quite a bit of feedback from people who've bought Commodores. Yeah. So let us know. Advice at caradvice.com. Keep those emails coming. If you've bought a new Holden Commodore, specifically a wagon, let us know why you bought it. Let us know why you love it. A couple of months ago, you would have noticed on the show, we talked about the SEMA Automotive Expo in Las Vegas, and we talked about all the fun we had over there, but we were working. <laughs> Car Advice founder Al Borsfaller joins us to talk about something that we mentioned at SEMA, mate. And I thought this was really interesting that Kia took the police stinger uh, to the US they to showcase. Yeah, yeah, to showcase what they're doing globally, because this is a big deal for Kia, isn't it? Absolutely. Look, it's really interesting. I, I spent a um, couple of days with Queensland Police in mm. Brisbane to see why they picked this thing up and the selection process was fascinating. You know, they even tested it on a racetrack yeah. to see if it was faster. Now, I was with wow. Kia at, at uh, SEMA, so I know a bit about the backstory. That car belonged to Queensland Police. It was one of their vehicles. Kia borrowed it back off them, mm -hmm. flew it to the US and took it there and put it on their stand specifically to showcase globally, hey, you can use our cars as police vehicles. Now, obviously, the North American market would be a huge deal for them. Oh, yeah. But what I really noticed while I was standing around the stand, shooting video, watching what was going on, there were a lot of people walking around saying, hey, 
that thing looks really good as I a know. police car. It well, actually looks really look, good. From Queensland, we do police cars pretty well. <laughs> like it's, You've been chased by a few? Uh, you know, do I, they I look good in your rear vision? Yeah. How do you spend a lot inside? of time in the back of that thing? <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Now, on, on the technology front, there's obviously a hell of a lot that goes into the process, and we weren't aware of this. You, you told us previously off air that um, the Queensland Police Department actually owns these vehicles, whereas it's different in other states. That's isn't right. It? So yeah. it's it's uh, it's self funded right. in Queensland. So okay. the tax, it's actually taxpayer money that sort of buys these. The Queensland Police maintains them and then they on sell them. Mm -hmm. In New South Wales, it's financed by a third party right. system. So look, I, I think in that regard, the Stinger won out um, in more ways than one. Obviously, mm. its performance was more yeah. than adequate yeah. for a pursuit car. But well, also, right. you know, with a seven year warranty. Um, by the time these cars come up for resale, which is about 80,000 kilometres roughly, mm -hmm. um, there's usually still a lot of time left on that warranty. The Commodore fans would hate to hear this, Paul, but Albor's touched on it there. The performance of the Stinger obviously lives up to what the uh, Highway Patrol needs, the yeah. police department needs. This this thing is a quick car. We own one at Caravice. We know it's quick. Yeah, I mean, we've done 4.8 seconds to 100 kilometres an hour, a quarter mile in under 12 seconds from yeah. memory. Yeah. So yeah. it is a fast, fast. car uh, and it, it drives well. The brakes are fantastic. It really is just a, a fantastic all-round mm -hmm. package. But what they told me was they actually prefer the way this delivers its power and torque to an SS Commodore, mm. which is a bit controversial. Mm, but, um, but you know, for their purposes, because it's got so much torque down low as it mm. builds up, it's a lot easier to get going and doesn't have to work as hard for them to do their duty. So, yeah, they, they told oh. me... Mm. One last question. Do they get the optional exhaust? <laughs> no, they question. don't. No. They don't. Uh, there you go. Yeah. That's Although, if I, was, if I was Kia Australia, mm. I would sort of just... Yeah. Mm. Put that on yeah, and not yeah, tell them. Yeah, just fit it accidentally. Yeah. <laughs> hey, this oh, is no, the greatest happened. marketing tool Kia's yeah. had for a long Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Well, if you're a Commodore or Falcon fan, bad luck. Uh, if you're a <laughs> Kia fan, they're doing really, really well. Advice at caradvice.com. Let us know if you've seen one of these on the road up in Queensland, if you think it looks as good as we do. Aside from when we get to pack up and go home, what's your favourite part of the show, Paul? Sitting next to you. Oh, right. No, that's not what I was looking for. I was fishing for reader questions <laughs> Sorry, and viewer questions. questions. Yep. That's the answer. We've got a really good one this week, and here it is. Living in the inner city, mm -hmm. and I have a bad back. I know how that feels. That's a bit dodgy. So I would like something compact and with some seat height so I don't have to bend over as far when I'm putting things in the car. So yes. that'll be in the luggage area as well. I like the look of the Ford EcoSport. Okay. Would you recommend it? Okay. Good question. Yes, who's this from? Uh, I don't know. We don't have a name. Let's say it's from John. Okay, John. Yeah. Um, I had the same issue when we had the Audi R8 through yeah. the office. Yeah. I found that because it's a low <laughs> sports car, a practical thing. It Ford just EcoSport, yeah, okay. Audi R8, slightly <laughs> different segments. <laughs> oh, my back, my $300,000 sports car. Um, oh. Look, I, I understand the point of this car. Yeah. I just, I'm just not a huge okay, fan of Okay, so it. where else yeah. do we go in the segment? I, I don't okay. think it's as bad as some people think. Yep. And I would probably throw the Holden Tracks in there as an option. Yep. I'd actually consider Holden Tracks, but where else do you go well, in the segment? I was just about to go Holden Tracks because yep. five-year warranty. Yep. The other downside to this car is the tyre on the back. Yeah. And the thing's huge. It yep. sits on the back of the car. It's and mounted up on the back like yeah, a big four-wheel drive. You've got to fling this yeah. thing open. And if you park like me in an apartment where you're backed into a wall, mm. it's just kind of impossible to get anything out. So yep. um, I'd probably park the EcoSport to the side. Tracks, Kia Soul. Uh, Ah, uh, yeah, Kia's another good yeah. option as yeah. well. These cars sit just a little bit higher, but they aren't quite SUVs. Hyundai Kona is the other That's one. That's another good so. option too, yeah. Look, I think the Ford EcoSport, as, to drive is obviously not as bad as some people exactly. are making out. It actually drives great. okay. Yeah. But you made the point there, so if the viewers at home don't know what we're talking about, the, the wheel, spare wheel is mounted on the back of the yeah. door. So when you open that door, it's A, quite heavy, yeah. and if you're on a slope, the door can have a tendency to come oh, back yeah. and whack you in the backside when you're loading your bags in and out. That's not ideal. Uh, and then, yeah, the other thing too is I think there are better options in that segment. We actually quite like the tracks and we yep. think that the tracks at the entry level of the segment is really good. So not necessarily the more expensive one, yeah, exactly. the more affordable tracks could be smarter to buy. And I think you made a good point there about Kia Soul with, with you know, Kia Australia saying they're going to discontinue that car. Mm. It's showing that those sorts of buyers that need that easier access in and out and have what we call a neutral seat height are starting to be overlooked a little bit, aren't they? Exactly, because you don't have many options there. Not everyone wants an SUV. Yeah. So uh, to the EcoSports credit, it has an excellent Sync 3 info, infotainment system. We do like that. Um, yeah. But it is built for the Indian market, which mm. is why the interior feels a little bit cheap and it has obviously just been retrofitted for, for Australia. Yeah. So so definitely there, go for the Holden tracks. Test drive both, obviously, but we'd recommend the tracks over those two. 
Well, Paul, we've reached that time of the show again. We've run out of time. Happens every week, doesn't it? It does, mate. Yeah, it is incredible how quickly we get here and <laughs> bang, we're stop. Out, out the door again. Before we go, though, before we say goodbye tonight, we just want to say thank you to all of you viewers out there for the questions that are coming in. We are getting heaps of emails yep. to advice at caradvice.com, aren't we? Yeah, and look, we, we will get back to you all. We're trying yeah, to we're doing just our best. Top yeah. of it. Um, but yeah, thank you for reaching out. And remember, caradvice.com, you can always head to the website to see even more stuff and see what we're up to and, and read all the latest car news and reviews. That's it. So advice at caradvice.com if you want to know anything. Please keep those emails coming. We will get back to you. Paul, thanks for joining us. Thank you, mate. Cheers. And we will be here again same time next week, 7.30pm on Your Money.